thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I only discovered CCAN when I was invited to give this talk, but I had a look at the website and, and uh, thought, gosh, these people are doing really interesting stuff, conceptually and theoretically. Um, and I thought, you know, coming along here with my healthcare background, th there's going to be some overlap, I think. Um, and there's probably going to be some disjointed bits as well, because I'm, I'm coming from a different field. But that's precisely the point. You know, it's the sort of contestation and the um, between, you know, the kind of stuff that CCAN does as mainstream and, and, and this stuff which I'm going to talk about, which is a little bit um, peripheral, perhaps. So I called it Complexity... Power and Evidence in the UK Healthcare Sector, a case study of e-health research. Um, and just to acknowledge my funders, my work is funded by a number of national bodies, charities, uh, government, all that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes my work isn't funded by anyone, so except Oxford University who pay my salary. I thought if you're going to tweet, I'd give you a hashtag of CCAN November 16. Uh, I know some people live tweet during my lectures uh, it's all rather fun to go afterwards and find out what people have been saying. Um, I found on the CCAM website a blog uh, uh, and a sentence in it, what works in practice can be difficult to ascertain. And I guess that's a bit of a, a text for today's talk. So what I want to do is three things. Um, I, I want to just give you a brief outline of the policy context for e-health research in the UK, by which I mostly mean England, because England uh, and uh, perhaps Wales, although again Wales was a bit different, uh, were different from Scotland. The National Programme for IT didn't run in Scotland, and that's quite important. Um, to consider how and why the randomised controlled trial became the preferred approach in e-health research. It's quite difficult to do any other kind of research in, in this particular field. And also to raise questions, as, as the title of this talk implies, about the interaction between knowledge and power in e-health research and policy, but perhaps more widely as well. So I don't know how much you know about randomised controlled trials, but the first randomised controlled trial in this country was done by Austin Bradford Hill in 1947, went on to become Sir Austin Bradford Hill, and it was a, a trial of streptomycin in tuberculosis, so the first antibiotic really, uh, and the reason why I did a randomised trial, because they only had a tiny amount, and they didn't have enough to treat everybody. And so Bradford Hill said, all right, then let's randomise people, and let's see which ones get better. And actually, it was a resounding success. He found the first cure for TB. So the principle um, of randomised trials is obviously you randomly allocate patients to either a drug or a placebo or perhaps a different drug. You have a predefined endpoint. You're going to say what you're going to measure, and you're going to have a predefined stop date because the statisticians will tell you if you carry on tossing the coin, at some point heads are going to be ahead. You can't just stop at that point. You've got to define how many times you're going to toss a coin. You know, that's just good statistical practice. So you have to have a predefined stop date and a predefined thing that you're going to measure as what they call a primary outcome measure. Great advantage, of course, is it controls not just for the confounding factors that you thought of, but also the confounding factors that you haven't thought of. So enough people, randomise them to, to two different arms, and everything that might influence the outcome has been, hopefully, evenly distributed between the two groups. And therefore, that the differences between the intervention and the control groups are quite likely to be due to whatever you've given them that's different, usually a drug, although increasingly these days, complex intervention of some other... Uh, type. The disadvantage, of course, and, and this is the, the central theme, is that if you're going to do that, you're also controlling out the effects of context. That's the point of the RCT. You may well be familiar with this little, um, what they call the hierarchy of evidence. Just put your hand in the air if you've ever seen that triangle before. Yeah, most of you. All right. So let, for those who haven't, um, the idea, if you're a clinical epidemiologist, is that uh, up at the top of the triangle is what is considered to be the best way of assessing an intervention. 
the best way is a randomized controlled trial. And actually, even above the randomized controlled trial is a systematic review of all the randomized controlled trials. But the RCTs are very much at the top. And you can see the green and the blue in the, in the um, middle, case reports, case series. These are considered to be less good methodologically. So the RCT sits right at the top. And of course, animal studies and test tube stuff. Because if you went and asked a, 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 you know, a group of lab scientists, they wouldn't accept this at all. But this really is very much the way the clinical trialists think. And it's, it's what gets taught is, you know, this is, this is good science. So, so the discourse we are working in is that the RCT is pretty important. All right, well, what's e-health? Well, funny thing is, it hasn't got a definition. That's the weird thing, or at least it's got many definitions. And I guess what they mean is anything to do with the technology. I was just sending someone an email saying, well, we're allowed to do digital health research, and that's really any kind, anything, so long as there's a technology involved, so it covers everything. And it is a bit like that. Um, I would say e-health research is research on technologies that focus on the technologies, that say we've got a technology and it's going to change the world. Let's look at the way it changes the world. And of course, that is really lined up with, I've called it a rather vague modernist vision of this, this time just around the corner where technology will have sorted out all the problems um, and it's also going to save us money, of course. And, and my team have done some work using discourse analysis on what we call the organizing vision for some aspects of e-health research. Um, I love this quote. I got it from a PhD student, actually, this magic day when super science mingles with the bright stuff of dream. it's dreams. It's from the pop group Rush. You know, that idea that wonderful, shiny future with technology getting rid of all the messy, horrible, difficult problems, um, including efficiency in the public sector. Technology is going to make our work more efficient. It's going to help coordinate care. We talk about the integration of care through technology and also all the problems of an aging society, multimorbidity, people living at home, etc., etc. They're all going to be solved through e-health. So that is broadly speaking on one slide with gross generalizations what I think this e-health policy discourse is. Does anyone want to disagree with me? Okay, see, with me. I mean, I am being provocative, but they asked me to be provocative. Look, you know who this guy is? Tony Blair, 1998. There he is, new Prime Minister. And he, one of his big things, I was told that um, the Blair legacy was going to be that he was going to sort out Iraq and he was going to introduce a, a, an electronic health record that you could, sit, you could view from any part of the NHS. Um, and I can't remember what the third thing was, something about education, wasn't it? Um, he didn't achieve any of those. Um, but this statement by Blair led to a number of things happening in the early 2000s and also to the National Programme for IT, which actually sort of took off officially in 2007 but was grumbling under since about 2004. Um, the official cost was £12.8 billion and it was very closely linked, very explicitly in the business plans with that, um, that whole new public management discourse of, you know, let's, let's make transparency a big issue, let's uh, make information available, let's improve the efficiency of the public sector, and let's improve accountability. So the National Programme for IT was going to be connecting up everyone's health records, it was going to be going pretty much paperless, paperless referrals, paperless records, um, paperless ordering of tests, paperless prescribing, etc. And then this was all going to kind of fall into place all smoothly. Um, it didn't work out like that. The National Programme for IT was highly controversial, but and, and, and it's quite interesting looking at the, the images that were used at the time. So there's a contrasting one here. Over here uh, to the left, it says, former shipman patient now in control. So this is a lady who did have Harold Shipman as her GP, managed not to get murdered by him, unlike 250 of her contemporaries. Um, but somehow the idea of transparency of information, access to information, this patient was going to log on and get access to her own health record. She hasn't actually got past the screensaver yet, but you know, we, she's working on it. Um, and somehow that was going to stop her getting murdered. 
right? So this was, this was an image that was widely used by Connecting for Health at the time. And then, of course, the, the, the civil liberties people got um, the opposite sort of image. Oh, hang on a minute. Our health records are very private. Surely this great transparency exercise is really just going to let these bureaucrats right into the, the most intimate and private aspect of our lives, that clinical consultation with our doctor. So these were the, these were the sort of ways that the, the, the National Programme for IT was framed. Nobody did it better than private eye. There's Tony Blair sitting there, and, and in fact the caption says something like, this guy hasn't got a clue what a computer is, and now he's in charge of this, what was it then, a 12.4 billion program on useless IT for the NHS. Um, the um, Department of Health weren't very happy with that private eye article, but actually the National Audit Office, after the uh, National Program for IT was closed down, were not far off that article. They had said, you know, this actually was an awful lot of money thrown at a huge programme of work, the most expensive civilian IT programme ever in any country. Um, and it wasn't entirely a failure, but there were certainly a lot of issues that um, the National Audit Office raised. So I could sum up to say this was a paradigm case of inflated hopes uh, and should I put underestimated challenges in e-health? So that's some, um, I was involved in evaluating this. I was one of the independent evaluators, or, or my team were. Um, what's happening recently, and you may be aware of this, is that Jeremy Hunt's going down an, a, a kind of uncannily similar route. So only six weeks ago, he is talking, I mean, this is uh, a direct quote from, I can't remember if it was a speech or a, an article he wrote, um, I'll leave you to read that. Magic day when super science mingles with the bright stuff of dreams. Um, pioneering, futuristic, shiny, isn't going to go wrong. We've got the same inflated hopes. We've got the same technological determinism. It is technology that is going to achieve the change. That is the assumption, and it's... It, it's a highly questionable assumption, um, and the same lack of attention to the system elements. The only we could get the technologies, here we are, here's the technologies, push them out, and, and the world is going to change. Um, something I've been researching, it's another aspect to be held, something, something I've been researching for a number of years now is uh, technologies in the home. So the idea the hospitals are full to bursting, you, could, you know, go to an outpatient appointment, you can't even get into the waiting room, it's so busy. Let's actually install it, technologies in people's homes, the smart home, and actually that will somehow keep us healthier and it'll help us to live with the illnesses we've got and it'll prevent us getting some of the illnesses we might otherwise have got uh, and it'll keep the hospitals much tidier because we won't have to go there. This is a typical image of the smart home wouldn't mind living there myself, actually. It looks quite nice, doesn't it? It's, first of all, it's usually a detached home, and it's always got woodblock floors, and white. everything's white. White sofas and white tables and things like that. You can see everything works. Um, and the idea is that in this smart home, we're going to monitor uh, your health in various ways. I think I had a picture of a smart toilet, but I think I took it out. Where, you know, you'd go to the loo, and it would monitor what was coming out and tell you how healthy you were and that kind of thing. But it also sends signals to the nurse or the doctor um, there's huge amounts of money going into this uh, kind of research. Oh, and the robots. The social presence robot. Um, again, uh, in fact, uh, you can see this couple. Look, there they are. They're living in their own home, and they're being monitored in all sorts of ways. But they might be a bit lonely. Um, so, so the robot will be here to keep them company. Um, so this is actually the Giraffe Plus robot, was developed um, through an EU uh, FP7, Framework 7 grant of 3 million euros, uh, really with the idea that there's going to be an awful... I mean, this is us. This is you and me, right? It's not them that are going to get old. It's us that are going to get old, and we are going to be in our smart homes with these robots. Um, I put out a tweet a couple of years ago because I went to speak at a robotics conference in Sweden um, and, and this little tweet says, my lecture on robotics really was chaired by a robot. Chapeau to the Swedes. Um, 
actually what was happening, although it was a good gimmick, and, and, and you know the, the robot there is in interviewing me about what I've said in my talk, in fact, what was happening was there was a guy sitting in the back row typing stuff, which the robot then spoke. So there was a human there. So for me, this, this didn't quite do it. I mean, it was, it was fun, but, it, you know, whatever. Now, <coughs> back in the real world, back in Newham, for example, where one of the big <coughs> um, research projects that uh, into this assisted living was done, um, this is a real home in Newham, okay? I, I work as a general practitioner, and I visit people who are sick. And I can tell you, <coughs> this is Michael Marmot's stuff, Social Determinants of Health, you're much more likely to get sick, and you're much more likely to be sicker with any particular condition if you are characterised by these social determinants, particularly poverty, particularly material poverty. Poor housing, cramped, damp housing, two, three, four generations under one roof, too many people to a room, um, <coughs> unsafe streets, certain minority ethnic groups, particularly those without full citizenship status, low health literacy, low system literacy. Right, they're okay in their own language and culture, but they, they come to the UK and they just don't know the system. This is why people present with stage four cancer rather than stage one cancer, it's all these things. <coughs> the socially excluded for all sorts of reasons. I put right at the bottom there, digital exclusion. It is true that if you are not IT literate, if you're not digitally literate, you're also going to have trouble accessing healthcare. But out of all the social determinants, all the research shows that poverty is the one, you know, right up at the top there. All right, so... We've got a problem here, haven't we? We've got this vision that e-health is going to solve everything. And, and somehow the person living in this grotty little flat, no doubt under a private landlord who might chuck them out if they don't pay rent, <coughs> is going to end up in a smart home with those white sofas and woodblock floors and you know, all that kind of thing. It's a big mismatch. Um, all right. Let's talk about a randomised controlled trial of what works. Who's heard of the whole systems demonstrator project? A few, just one or two of you. Okay, that's fine. You don't need to have heard of it because I'm going to explain it. This was a multi-million pound randomised trial of telehealth and telecare, and they had a total of something like 6,000, just over 6,000 people who were randomised to either getting the e-health or being the control group. Now, telehealth meant monitoring some aspect of your health, usually things like your blood pressure, your blood oxygen level. You, know, you can have that clip on your finger and it will tell you whether you're 98% or 80%. Um, your weight, um, various other things that, that are clearly sort of health-related. Telecare is monitoring your safety. It's monitoring whether or not you, you're likely to fall. So you might carry a falls detector and if it can sort of work out whether you've fallen over or not, um, or so to speak. Um, smoke alarms, um, flood alarms, that kind of thing. So the, so the telecare in general goes through the social services councils, that kind of thing, and the telehealth tends to be connected up to some, something to do with doctors and nurses. Anyway, so they tried both of these in the whole system demonstrated trial. The control group got usual care. The primary outcome measure, remember I was telling you about that TB trial, you have to identify one thing that you're going to measure between the two groups. And that, in this trial, was hospital admission. The idea was this stuff was going to keep you out of hospital. And then there were various secondary outcome measures, particularly things like use of services, because as I've said, this e-health discourse, the idea is that the technology is going to save, it's going to make us more efficient. Well, it... The idea is, therefore, that the patient's supposed to stay at home and not go to the doctor because we've got all this kit in their home. So very important secondary outcome measure was, was whether or not the use of services went down. So what happened? Well, after, I <coughs> can't remember how long it was, I think it was a year of this, um, the telehealth group did have fewer hospital admissions. The question was why? Because they went and did baseline assessments on everybody. 
intervention group and the control group, nurses would go into the home and assess the people in the control group and thought, oh, crikey, this old lady's got an awful lot of things wrong with her and she's not getting any of the technology. We'd better send her into hospital because she's on the borderline. The intervention group, possibly people with comparable problems, they'd say, oh, well, never mind, we're monitoring them anyway, so they didn't send them in. So what happened was the control group had more hospital admissions, but all of those hospital admissions happened right at the beginning, just after the assessment visit. So then the statisticians had an absolute field day of saying, well, were the groups comparable at baseline, and you can, you can follow these arguments. In addition, the health economists came out with a figure quite a long time after the end of the study uh, that said the cost per quality adjusted life year of, of, of using this telehealth equipment was 88,000. Now, 88,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year is conventionally thought of as unaffordable. It's a huge amount. Um, I used to sit on NICE, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, you know, these panels, and we used to say 30,000 pounds per quality was, a, well, it was okay. You know, if, if it came out at less than 30, you'd sort of think, yeah, yeah, we'll reprove it. If it was up there in the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, you wouldn't. Telecare came out at 300 and something thousand pounds uh, per quality. So yes, these things were effective, but they were massively expensive for what you were getting. And it would have been far cheaper just to kind of increase the number of nurses or whatever. So the WSD was highly controversial. The other thing that happened with, with the whole Simpson demonstrator was because the Department of Health funded it, and they funded it in order to demonstrate what a good idea telehealth and telecare was, they had access to some of the early data before the statisticians had finished their arguments about whether or not things were comparable at baseline. And so as far as the, the DH were concerned, this stuff worked. It was magic, wonderful, and they put happy quotes from patients on their website before the university groups had finished analysing their data. And those of you who are from an academic background know that ain't cricket, and they, they, the university people were not very happy about that, but they were very diplomatic and they didn't, they didn't have an argument with the DH. It's a very interesting title, Whole System Demonstrator for a randomised trial. I mean, Bradford Hill called his trial a randomised controlled trial of streptomycin in TB. So why was this whole system demonstrator? Whole suggested that this trial was going to provide definitive answers to all the important questions. It's, it's, it's wrapped it up, the whole lot. System suggested it was going to capture system influences. I still don't know how they ever thought this was going to be possible because an RCT controls for the effect of context. And demonstrator is very fishy. Department of Health felt they already knew the answer and the trial was simply to demonstrate that answer to the rest of us. So this was worrying, in, in just in the title, never mind the rest of it. Um, all right, when it was published, I wrote a letter to the British Medical Journal, because I'm that sort of person, you know, I sort of fire off these letters and this is angry from Finchley sort of thing. Um, and the, the, the scientists published a very reasonable, very scholarly piece of work in, in the BMJ. And as part of that, they listed what they thought were the limitations of the trial. And I was concerned that they hadn't listed as one of the limitations that the Department of Health had got its fingers in the jam. Um, they said the Department of Health reviewed the protocol and provided project manager support. So as far as they were concerned, they were scientists acting independently of the DH, who just kindly provided one or two junior researchers. The DH, I pointed out, were actually making rather bigger claims to their uh, involvement. Uh, and as far as their conversations with industry were concerned, uh, they refer to a randomised controlled trial funded and run by the Department of Health. So they're really claiming that they, they were driving the boat. Now, I was concerned that the authors, the scientists who were doing this work, who were friends of mine, you know, they're, they're decent people, um, were very measured and very cautious in what they said, but they were not prepared to stand up and challenge the Department of Health, who were putting up these, um, I think, frankly, distorted quotes and, 
figures, you know, sort of uncorrected raw data on their own website. Despite the fact that in lecture rooms in academic conferences, individual members of the research team were perfectly happy to say that they, they were hopping mad at what was going on, but they, they weren't publishing. So the scientific team were not actually publishing the fact that they were pretty annoyed with what the DH was doing. Um, I pointed out in my letter to the BMJ, which printed it, um, that actually randomised trials, because they control for context, can't evaluate politically driven e-health programs. They just can't do that because they're, con they're controlling out the political aspect, if you like. Um, and I was pointing out that the Department of Health were behaving in a highly political way. But I was also saying, and, and I was challenging the editor of the British Medical Journal here for saying, uh, for publishing a randomised trial, but not publishing studies that might be designed to capture these, this political behaviour. So they were really saying, we only want the science and we don't want all that stuff around the back. Um, and this uh, letter was, was widely um, cited, actually. My letter, uh, people will quote that uh, and then go on um, and provide further critiques. So this was the first of, of, of a number of critiques of the WSD. Well, a couple of years ago, one of the lead researchers from the Whole Systems Demonstrator program wrote a blog. Very interesting blog. So he said, well, it was a great program, came up with some encouraging results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, however, the echoes from that long gone time, this is about five years ago we're talking about, are increasingly providing ammunition for the naysayers, when in reality, the world is now a totally different place. So he's saying, well, you could take the WSD results and say, well, telehealth and telecare are too expensive. But hang on a minute. No, no, we, don't need, we shouldn't take any notice of that, he's saying, because the technology is unrecognisable from the one that they were bidding for the WSD in 2006. But actually, I think he was writing in 2014, um, technology's moved on. It's much faster. It's much cheaper. It's much more easily kind of blended into everything. Um, so really... He says, we now know much more about how to implement the technology. In particular, I love this, it delivers greatest benefit when part of an overall programme for improving care and not, as the trial treated it, as a simple intervention like most drugs. Someone's got a hand up. Yeah, 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 yeah but shout out because they're yeah. recording it. Yes, I'm saying uh, absolutely, and, and, and the, the political bit is the bit where I said they called it whole system demonstrator, that the DH who were funding the trial, they had already decided what the results were going to be. They were going to demonstrate that the technology works. As soon as they found anything in that study to uh, confirm what they already thought they knew, which was the technology works, this is all about what works, uh, they stuck it on the website, they were building their relationships with industry, and the scientists were saying, wait a minute, we haven't finished analysing the data. You can't just pick bits of raw data. Okay, now all that behaviour, all those arguments were going on backstage. By the time they published the paper in the BMJ, the government had already developed all these relationships with industry. So the trial itself is in some ways scientifically pure, and they, they did it according to the rules of RCTs, but the political context was a very particular one. Um, last thing that uh, Charles Lowe said, is actually in 2013, the WSD was in a sense an oxymoron. This is from one of the principal investigators. It was an oxymoron, he's saying, as both control and intervention groups were in the same system. We were unable to demonstrate the effect of whole system change. Of course. So why were they funding RCTs? So even these people who are trialists realised that they couldn't possibly have studied whole system change with an RCT. So let me summarise. Despite its 
epistemological claim to producing context-free findings, the randomised trial is situated. Okay, so context inevitably shapes the research questions, the outcome measures, the execution of the trial, the dissemination of the findings. You can't splice it out. Today's trial, if you've got a trial that's published today, it's going to relate to yesterday's technology or yesterday's version of it. There will have been several upgrades since that trial was done. Um, so you have this thing that I call the sorcerer's apprentice phenomenon, that any RCT of a technology, if it comes out saying the technology is not very good, not, you know, it's not very cost effective, they'll always say, ha ha, but there's a better version of it. But the other thing is that no, neither people nor technologies can be meaningfully studied in isolation from this socio-technical system in which we all live. So e-health technologies that are embedded in systems, whichever one of the ones I've been talking about, um, they're all embedded in a wider system. They raise all sorts of questions, not just does it work or does it prevent hospital admissions. There's loads and loads of questions. So these cannot ever be reduced to technology on versus technology off experiments. It, they just can't do it. In my analysis of the National Programme for IT, I came up with a number of different worlds. And, and probably all of you are more comfortable in one of these worlds. Uh, actually, I'm in the academic world, so I'm in a different world. In the political world, what the politicians are asking is, how can this technology help us achieve our manifesto promises? Or how can we achieve some kind of political goal uh, through the introduction of this technology? In the clinical world, the doctors, nurses, midwives, whatever, are asking, is this going to help my patients? Is it going to improve the process of care? The technical world, technical designers, they're actually quite arty people. Have you, is anyone here a designer? I mean, what they want is something beautiful, something aesthetically beautiful, something that purrs along. Um, and they're keen on getting something that's very elegant. And it's quite interesting, with a, with a designer, they will carry on and carry on and carry on until they've got something that's fabulous. I sat next to a bloke the other day who designed the iWatch, and he was, he was showing me all these things on my iPhone I didn't know I had. Um, and he was trying to persuade me that these were very beautiful features. You know, that's, that's the, the brain of the designer. Um, commercial world, of course, it's about return on investment, particularly for shareholders. The regulatory world, there is a big world. I mean, this, we live in the, or we, the Britain has the most over-regulated healthcare system in the world. Um, try introducing any new technology into the NHS, you'll come bash against regulatory barriers. Um, and when you're in there with those committees and those lawyers that are talking about, well, you know, privacy this and information governance that, that's their world. They're not really interested in an elegant design. <laughs> and then, of course, the patient wants to know, hang on a minute, I, I want to achieve X, or I want to be able to live like Y. Is this technology going to help me? So what you've got here is each group of stakeholders are going to set different success criteria. And when we looked at an aspect of the National Programme for IT, we looked at about 10 groups, but we had 28 different success criteria for the introduction of one technology. So, you know, you can't randomise trial that. Let me talk about case study. Um, as a social scientist, I'm much more interested in case study than I am in RCTs. Ben Flyberg, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, has written this brilliant paper, which you can get on the internet, just put five misunderstandings about case study research. And what he says is that a scientific discipline, by which he means a social science discipline, that lacks in-depth case studies is impoverished. What we need is more richly described case studies, detailed narratives of what happened and why. Um, and that's the kind of stuff I do. So when we wrote our final report on a couple of the most controversial aspects of the National Programme for IT, we wrote a sort of 200-page detailed narrative. Um, actually, I remember someone saying to me, we were expecting you to do an audit and we got the road to Wigan Pier. Um, <laughs> in other words, we really did use 
narrative approaches. We told stories and stories within stories to try and build up a richly described case study. We called it the devil's in the detail. And actually, we also spun off a few academic papers from this, my favourite of which was uh, called Why Nationally Health Programmes Need Dead Philosophers. And it was about... It, it draws on a, a philosopher, Wittgenstein, who, who, who was very into this sort of... Um, uh, or he inspired a, inspired a tradition of real-world case study. Um, and what we said in this was that... And we drew a conclusion from some very detailed analysis of parts of the story that national e-health programmes unfold as they do because no one understands what's going on. Everybody's feeling a different bit of the elephant. And we said, these detailed accounts that illuminate what's going on are not statistically generalisable, but my goodness, they're illuminative and they are crucial. And if you want to run an e-health programme better, read lots of good stories, was basically what we were saying. Now, this was massively um, antithetical to what was going on in medicine. Remember that triangle I showed you at the beginning with the randomised trial at the top? Um, and what we're saying is, I'll just tell some good stories. And actually, you know, I was sort of having to have my annual appraisal and my head of the department saying, what are you, what are you up to, Trish? You, know, you can't just do like a randomised trial like everybody else. Um, when the National Programme for IT came out, they had a committee. They, they, they outsourced the evaluation to a group from Birmingham led by Richard Lilford, very good epidemiologist, does very good RCTs. And he set up a committee to oversee and police the methodology of all the different bits of the evaluation. And they wrote a series of papers, how to make evaluation more methodologically robust, and what they said was, well, it's a shame we can't do a randomised trial of the National Programme for IT, but we'll do the next best thing called a step wedge. I'll show you what a step wedge is. What they, what they said here was that um, health information systems should be evaluated with the same rigour as a new drug. Um, otherwise, we might have to bring in social, economic, political stuff. And they're really worried about this. We have to strip it away with rigour. So they drew these sort of boxes and arrows diagrams and basically sort of abstracting out things like, what do they got here? IT response times, patient throughput, staff morale. Each of these sort of variables were put into a bit of the box. And at the end, you have morbidity and mortality and satisfaction and cost effectiveness. So this is what they called a logic model for evaluation. And then they had this thing called the step wedge where different towns would come on stream with... Uh, the, the, the new technology at different times. And so effectively, each one of them could be a control for different bits of the system. Very clever. Not quite as good as a randomised trial, but getting there. The really interesting thing was, when they came to publish the result of the biggest evaluation in the National Programme for IT, they didn't do a step wedge design. They did a qualitative case study, just like we had. So, of course, we got in really quick here, myself and Jill Russell, and said, oh, right, so you were going to do a step wedge, and it was all going to be very robust and logical with diagrams and arrows from your, your, your rectangles, but actually, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do any kind of controlled experiment. You can't control for everything that's happening in all those different worlds. So, in the end, they came to us and said, well, can you quickly train up some of our researchers in, in your qualitative ethnographic stuff? So, we said, we'd be delighted to. And uh, we then produced this uh, paper called Why Do Evaluations of E-Health Programmes Fail? An alternative set of guiding principles. So if you move away from your RCT, there's another way of doing it. Um, and we said, wait a minute, if you call it an intervention, you can do an experiment on it. But actually what we're talking about is e-health dreams, visions, policies and programmes, and they actually splurge out of your um, experimental box. This is, this is much more complex, uh, and, and, and it will slip away from your experimental gaze. So we drew on some work by Savile Kushner, uh, who's now in New Zealand, has become a friend, actually, since we wrote this nice thing about him. He said the logic model of evaluation is elegant in its simplicity, appealing for its rationality, 
reasonable in asking little more than people do what they say they will do, predefined outcome measures, and it's efficient in its economical definition of which data count. We're going to me measure this, this, and this. But, and this is the problem with complex systems, of course, programs have multiple and contested goals, which I hope I persuade you of, so no single goal can be a fixed referent for success. Outcomes are not stable. They do all sorts of things over time, don't they? Um, the causal link between input and output is interrupted by intervening variables. And program learning, which leads away from the initial objectives, um, gets defined as failure. Actually, you could be doing really well. It's just you hadn't thought of it when you set your outcome measures. Um, so... We were also concerned that if you don't tell the story, you don't actually mention any of the people. You just have all these abstracted variables like staff morale. Actually, when you're talking about the American election, you want to talk about Donald Trump. It's him. It's not, it's not some abstracted variable. It's actually particular people. Sorry, I had to bring that one in. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but there is a problem here, isn't there, that when you, when you go into the sort of rationalist mode that you abstract out the very things that are key. And one of the things that was really key to the, um, the story of the devils in the detail was Richard Granger, who was the person who was in charge of the program. He had a very particular view. He also had a particular personality, and we wrote about it. Uh, but if we'd been doing an RCT, we probably wouldn't have been able to do that. So we, and I won't spend too much time on this slide. I won't, there was someone, was that a hand up? No, I'm scratching my head. Um, Oh, the time, yeah, okay. Um, you can see that there are different criteria for uh, defining an evaluation as robust. If you go down the logic model, you're going down method, and you're valuing all those objective things. But if you actually go down the in-depth critical case study route, you're valuing different things. Um, it's much more about being theoretically robust than being methodologically robust, although we hope we're both. I'm going to very quickly show you some of Barry McDonald's work. Um, the idea that there are three types of evaluation of government programmes. There's a bureaucratic, autocratic, or scientific, and democratic. So bureaucratic is when you hire a management consultancy to write you a report that tells you what you want to know. Thank you very much, and we're paying for it, so this is what we want you to say happens. It doesn't happen as much as it used to. Autocratic or scientific evaluation is when you say, I'm going to give this university the money and they are going to do a scientific evaluation like the whole system demonstrator. The evaluator is independent in the sense that they can write a paper for the BMJ, disagreeing with the government. Um, but I would say there's a, there's a step further which is democratic or deliberative evaluation, where the evaluators are not just doing what works experiments for the government, they are critically questioning what's going on, whose voices are not being heard, where's the hidden agenda here, where are the power relationships, how come we're only allowed to do randomised trials, how come we're not allowed to ask about industries, fingers, you know, whatever. Um, but at the moment, this is not much on the agenda. But this is what we were saying in our Why Do We Health Evaluations we, Why Do Evaluations of Health Programs Fail paper, that actually the randomised trial is reducing complex social, political and moral questions to oversimplified scientific and technical questions, particularly this question of what works. And it's highly problematic. In our view, we said the tricky questions are more philosophical and political than methodological and procedural. So now, what are they doing? They're funding more randomised trials of e-health. There was one uh, began not long ago. It's still going on. And they said this to me recently um, when I applied to do an in-depth case study. Uh, there was some concern about the absence of a trial. Members of the subpanel are of the view it would be plausible to design and execute one. In other words, just to be possible to do a randomised trial, uh, we therefore think you should do one. We actually protested at this. We appealed, and they still gave us the money, so that was good. Um, <coughs> so, e-health research funding, 
mostly from these sources. Technology is often supplied free by industry. Panels consist of scientific experts, but who've been picked for their adherence to the experimental rationalist RCT mindset, strong emphasis on this scientific objectivity, and a hidden bias in that we're just going to get more experimental designs which are going to not address the more fundamental moral and political questions. <laughs>